Welcome to this proof of concept video. Today we'll discuss the cryptanalysis of the Visionaire cipher. In particular, it can be tricky to understand how the key length step works, so I'd like to give an especially visual and intuitive explanation of that. First, what is Visionaire cipher? It's a fancy version of Caesar cipher. To get started, it's convenient to associate numbers to the Roman alphabet as shown. These really lie on a wheel because we should think of it wrapping around so that after Z comes A again. So the numbers should really be thought of as living modulo 26. That is, after 25 comes 0 again. So 26 is the same thing as 0, 27 is the same thing as 1, 28 is the same thing as 2. For Caesar cipher, each plain text letter, remember plain text is the word for the unencrypted message, each plain text letter gets shifted some number of notches around the wheel to give the corresponding cipher text letter. So for example, if I'm using a shift of two notches, then A becomes C, B becomes D, C becomes E, and so on. Notice that Y becomes A, because we're wrapping around, and Z becomes B. So that's it. If our plain text is zoo in numbers 25, 14, 14, and our key is 2, then we add 2 to each. Then our ciphertext, that's the word for the encrypted message, is BQQ. In this cipher, Caesar cipher situation, we fix a single shift, so say two notches, which we can call C, because remember two is the number for C. So that's the key for the cipher. For Visionaire cipher, our key is not just one letter, but a string of letters. It could be a word. So suppose we use the key BOP, also known as 1, 14, 15. Then the idea is to shift the first letter of the plain text by B, the second letter by O, and the third letter by P. When we've used up the key letters, we start again. So suppose I want to encrypt the message PROSPER using the key BOP. Here's my plain text and the associated numbers. Here's how the key lines up with the plain text. I just repeat BOP, BOP, BOP over and over again. To compute the cipher text, I'm going to shift the plain text by the key values, which is the same as to say add them. Here's the ciphertext. So look, for example, at the first column. Here I take 15 plus 1 to get 16 for the ciphertext. In the next column, I shift 17 by 14 to get 31. But remember, we wrap around the alphabet, so 31 is actually the same thing as 5. So how can you see that? I can just subtract 26 from 31, because going around 26 notches actually doesn't change the letter. So it's just the remaining 5 notches that matter. That's working modulo 26. A few things to notice about how Visionaire plays out. The same input letter can give different output letters, or different input letters can give the same output letters. Keep that in mind for later. If you have the key, you can decrypt by shifting backwards by each key letter. So suppose I have the ciphertext, and then I write the key over top of it. Then I can infer the plain text by subtracting the key value from the ciphertext value. So for example, 16 minus 1 is 15, and 5 minus 14 is 17, when we work modulo 26. You can just count backwards on the alphabet ring from 5, and you'll end up at 17. The purpose of this video is to describe how to break a ciphertext without having the key. This is called cryptanalysis. To break a Visionaire cipher, there are three steps. First, we have to figure out the key length. Then we can use that to break up the ciphertext according to the key length. And finally, we use frequency analysis on each part. Before we begin, let me point out that we are assuming the plain text is randomly chosen English, not just a random string. That's going to be essential to everything that we do. In particular, random bits of the English language have a standard frequency distribution of their letters. That is, a probability of each letter appearing. So this is what it looks like. E is most likely, A is very likely, etc. So in fact, in my mind, it sort of looks like this. Two big spikes, single spikes, then a third wider spike finishing out the fork. Then there's two wide humps, and then there's a little bit of a dead zone. So keep that picture in mind. What we'll assume more precisely is that the plain text is decently long, and its letters follow this distribution. It doesn't actually need to make sense or be English, but it should have English language frequency behavior, meaning the E's are the most likely, etc., according to this graph. One can use frequency analysis to analyze a Caesar cipher. For if you take the frequencies of the cipher text, it's likely to look a lot like the graph we just saw, only shifted over. So in our example, if the plain text has this top frequency in red, then our cipher text will have the same frequencies shifted over by 2, shown in blue. 
Instead of E appearing the most often, G will appear the most often. Everything will move over and the last two bars fall off the chart and move to the front. So for Caesar cipher, just graphing the frequencies, we can guess the shift by a simple visual examination. Now, Visionaire appears to fix this problem because the shifts vary. So even a regular ciphertext like A, 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 A will end up having different letters in the output because each A is shifted by a different amount. So with key A, B, C, some are shifted by one, some are shifted by two, some by none. So remember how we saw different letters can become the same and the same letters can encrypt differently. Here's a frequency chart for English letters in red versus a frequency chart for an example Visionaire ciphertext in blue. So you'll see the Visionaire distribution is much more uniform. The frequencies have been all jumbled and evened out. A naive frequency analysis like for Caesar cipher just won't work. However, we can still use frequency analysis in our attack. Let's begin with finding the key length. This is the most interesting step. Let's think of our plain text not as a specific example, but as consisting of a bunch of positions where English letters can go with a certain probability. I'll draw these as red boxes. The red box denotes that the letter there should most likely be an E, but also very likely an A, etc. It follows the English frequency distribution shown again here in red. Now, suppose my key is just two letters long, A, C. Now let's consider the first position. A means zero, so it's not a shift at all. So the ciphertext's probability distribution is the same as the plain text here. It's most likely an E, pretty likely an A, and so on. So I'll draw a red box there. Now in the second position, I have key C, which is two. So this gets shifted over by two. Here, the ciphertext is most likely to be a G, very likely to be a C, etc. So it follows the shifted English frequency distribution, <clears throat> which I'll use the blue color for. So red is the usual English distribution or probabilities and blue is the shifted distribution or probabilities. That means I want to draw a blue box for the ciphertext there. That letter has a certain probabilistic behavior, which I indicate with the color. Now, continuing, the patterns repeat. Red, blue, red, blue, etc. Okay, fine. So this is the idea. We have red and blue positions in the ciphertext, which have different behaviors probabilistically. Let's now consider what some of those probabilities really are. Let's write red v for the vector of probabilities for the standard frequencies of English. That is, the first entry is the probability of an A, the second entry is the probability of B, etc. Phrased another way, the probability that any red box is an A is just the zeroth entry of the vector V. Now, what if we compare two red boxes? Remember, I'm writing V for the vector of probabilities like on the last slide. What is the probability that they are both A? We multiply the probability that one is A times the probability that the other is A. So that means we square the first entry of the probability vector. We might also ask, what is the probability that two red boxes are the same? It's the sum of the probability that they're both A, plus the probability that they're both B, plus the probability that they're both C, and so on and so on. In fact, that's just the dot product of the red vector with itself. The exact same facts are true for the blue vector. Notice that the blue vector has the same entries as the red vector, just in a different order. So in fact, we get that the probability of a blue box matching itself is equal to the probability of a red box matching itself, because the dot product of a vector with itself doesn't depend on the order of the entries. Okay, so what if we want to compare a blue box with a red box? Let's collect those facts we have about blue and red vectors. The probability, probability that both are A is the probability the red one is A times the probability the blue one is A, so the product of their first entries. The probability of them being the same at all is the sum of the probability that they're both A plus the sum of the probability that they're both B, etc, etc. But this is just their dot product. So in summary, the probability that two boxes of the same color agree has one value, and the probability that two boxes of different color agree is a different probability. They're both given by dot products. In fact, we even know which one is a greater probability. This depends on a little geometry of vectors. Recall that the dot product between two vectors is given by the product of its lengths with the cosine of the angle between them. 
both the red and blue vector have the same overall length. So the only difference is the angle that they point. So there's some angle theta between these vectors and the dot product picks it up. Now, cos theta is largest when theta is zero, which happens when the vectors are the same. Otherwise, it's smaller. So the bottom line here is that the boxes of the same color are more likely to agree when you compare them. That's because we're taking the dot product of a vector with itself. When we compare boxes of different colors, we'll get smaller dot products. When the boxes agree, we'll call that a coincidence. So what we're saying here is coincidences are more likely between boxes of the same color. Let's go back to our ciphertext. So suppose I compare the ciphertext with a copy of itself, offset by one notch. Blue boxes lie below red ones, and red ones lie beneath blue ones. So the probability of a coincidence, two letters agreeing between the ciphertext and its shift, is small. But suppose I offset it over by two notches. Then the probability of a coincidence goes up because I'm comparing boxes of the same color. So we'll see more coincidences when we set it off by an even offset. We'll see fewer when it's an odd offset. So that is, we pick up more coincidences when the red boxes line up. For a longer key, we may have more different colored vectors to compare, not just red and blue. But they'll line up um, the same color whenever we offset by a multiple of the key. So in practice, what I do is print out my ciphertext on a long single strip twice. I put one strip below the other, offset by n notches, and count how many coincidences I get. Maybe at one offset, I pick up a pair of Vs. At two and three, I don't get too many. Each time, I just count how many coincidences I get. Here at four, I get a pair of Vs again. At five, I seem to be getting lots of coincidences. So here's the kind of pattern that I'm going to see when I collect that data. So here I'm going to draw a graph for a given offset, how many coincidences I get. So when they line up, lots of coincidences. When I shift, fewer coincidences. Now when the colors line up again, which happens when I offset by exactly the key length, I'll see more coincidences again. Then fewer, 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 and more, etc. So these peaks let me guess the key length. Let's move on now to step two, breaking up the ciphertext. Let's suppose the key length is n. What I'm going to do is pull the ciphertext into n different bins. Every nth letter goes in the same bin. On the screen, I've colored each bin for key length 3. So there are three bins. The first contains the 0th, 3rd, 6th, 9th letters of the ciphertext. The second contains the first, fourth, seventh, etc. The third contains the second, fifth, eighth, etc. So I could write that in terms of modular notation like this. The first bin is those characters whose position is 0 mod n. The second bin contains those characters whose position is 1 mod n, etc. Okay. So I've broken up the ciphertext. The whole point here is that the bins contain ciphertext letters which were shifted using the same key letter. If my key was BOP, the first bin is all the letters that were shifted by B. The second bin is all the letters that were shifted by O. And the third bin is all the letters that were shifted by P. Of course, I don't know the key, but I do know that the bins are grouped by key letter. Now on to step three. I run a frequency analysis on each bin. Let's just look at bin number one. Here are the standard English frequencies in red. I take the frequencies of all the letters um, that are in the bin, and I see something like this in blue. So this looks a lot like the English frequency is just shifted by two. So I guess that the key letter is two, also known as C. And then I move on to bin number two and guess the next letter, etc. Finally, I have a guess for the key. So then I just have to give it a whirl and see if I can decrypt the ciphertext using the key. Does the result look like a valid English message? Well, we hope so. So that's visionary cryptanalysis. A few caveats. First, this isn't the only way to approach cryptanalyzing the visionary cipher. There are other ways, especially to find the key length. And second, 
There are, of course, ways that this could fail. Let me remind you that it depends on the plain text really looking like English, or at least following the correct probabilities for English letters. But you could come up with plain texts that mess this up. So for example, some people write whole novels not containing the letter E just for fun. You might choose a key length N and then make sure your E's never un end up in positions that are multiples of N. Or you might do more devious things. Cryptanalysis is an art, as is designing ciphers, and it's a constant battle of wits between the cryptographer and the cryptanalyst. Enjoy. <laughs>